I am Beth Lemelboss. I know many of you, um, but if we haven't spoken before, I am uh, the program coordinator and collections manager here at the Historical Society. And I'm just going to adjust this a little. So um, I've been with the Historical Society for nine years, going on 10 now. Um, and it's been wonderful the whole time. I think this is the, my favorite exhibit that I've put together. And so I'm thrilled to have you all here um, to, uh, to talk about the exhibit, to talk about prohibition and its effects on Harbor Springs. I think Harbor Springs is sort of a wonderful case study for uh, how the prohibition affected small communities. So we will go ahead and get started. Basically what we're gonna be covering uh, in this lecture is we are going to dive a bit deeper um, into the history of prohibition, a little bit deeper than my exhibit goes. We'll talk about how prohibition was actually passed, the path to prohibition, um, how it was enforced or not in many areas. And then we'll turn our attention to local speakeasies and gangsters and um, Harbor Springs connections to prohibition here. So, uh, and as I mentioned, um, the exhibit will be open through the end of the year. So if you haven't gotten a chance to come yet, please join us whenever you do get the chance. All right, so starting out, um, temperance fervor and, and sort of swept the country at various times in the United States history and in Michigan. Um, but particularly in Michigan, there were strong pushes for temperance and for uh, the prohibition of alcohol in the 1830s, the 1850s, um, and again in about the 1880s. Most of those early temperance movements were tied um, to the church. They were tied particularly strongly to women and particularly to uh, families. And the strongest push was in the 1870s to 1880s. So in 1873, there was an official women's crusade uh, that took place. And again, I mentioned that prohibition was strongly tied to women at this time. And it was primarily uh, the Women's Crusade was arguing for moderation or the complete abstinence from intoxicating beverages to protect families and mothers and children from the evils of drunkenness, um, from abuse, from misuse of money and funds, and from what they saw as the breakdown of the family unit. Um, what the Women's Crusade did um, is they would have these, uh, these events called pray-ins, kind of like a sit-in, but a pray-in, where they would go either into a saloon or stand outside of it and sing hymns um, and pray and call on the owners of these saloons uh, to close down uh, and change their wicked ways. And um, surprisingly, these were actually fairly effective. Um, many saloon owners, if they didn't close, which I would say a handful did close, but many changed their hours, for example, so that they wouldn't be open on the payday of most of the workers in the town so that the uh, men wouldn't immediately go and spend their paychecks at the saloons. But uh, for the most part, these were sort of temporary measures. Um, saloons didn't usually close for good after this. And the Women's Crusade really only took place from 1873 to 1874. Now, from the Women's Crusade, however, a much stronger organization took form. So in about 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed. Um, and its goal, again, just to protect the home from alcohol abuse. Um, they did champion some other civil rights issues, women's suffrage. Um, and that kind of thing. Their second president actually was the most influential. You can see a picture of her right here. This is Frances Willard. And she traveled extensively, more than 30,000 miles a year, giving speeches, um, rallying support, lecturing in churches and all over the world um, in, you know, for the cause of temperance and moral reform. Um, and eventually the Women's Christian Temperance Union spread not just in the United States, but for example, here's a banner from Australia in Sydney, and here's a pin in the shape of Australia. And so their uh, organization really became one of the first powerful um, women's groups and movements, not just in the United States, but globally as well. Um, so they carried quite a strong, um, a strong presence. 
kind of on the more extreme side of the temperance union. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was mostly advocating reform, doing things like pray-ins. Um, and then you have a more radical figure here in Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation um, originally began in the Christian Temperance Union, but eventually decided uh, that she needed to be more directly involved in the closing of saloons. And so you see a wonderful picture of her with her hatchet and her Bible. And she went around and destroyed saloons in her local area and then all across the country. She was arrested something like 30 times um, and coined the phrase hatchetations for her work, which she believed was divinely inspired. Um, there's some fabulous cartoons um, of Carrie Nation. Uh, there were some fabulous signs that would be hung in saloons that said, all nations welcome except Carrie. Um, and uh, at one point after being arrested, this is one of my favorite stories, Carrie was talking to the police officer who had come to arrest her and said, I'm a woman whose heart is breaking to see the ruin of these men, the desolate home and broken laws, and you are oath bound to close this man's business. Why don't you do your duty? And a crowd of women behind her started chanting, do your duty, do your duty. And the constable did. He arrested the saloon operator instead of arresting Carrie. So she definitely did have an impact um, and quite a following. There were souvenirs of her hatchet, little hatchet pins um, that you could buy at some of her rallies. There were other groups, of course, that advocated for prohibition. Um, one of the most powerful besides the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union was the Anti-Saloon League. Um, their mission, of course, is right in their name, but they were one of the first large groups in the country to use pressure politics and try to change the actual law. Um, they were founded in 1893 in Oberlin, Ohio, and sort of coincidentally, the Women's Christian Temperance Union and many of the early women's crusade movements in the 1870s were actually in Ohio as well. Um, so Ohio is actually kind of a birthplace of some of these prohibition power hitter groups. The Anti-Saloon League um, started out strongly in Ohio, putting pressure on uh, the elected officials to represent their constituency and they published thousands and thousands and thousands of pamphlets and sent them to their elected officials to make it appear as if public opinion supported prohibition. And um, they were extremely successful. They managed to get Democratic governors elected in Ohio and um, were able through their massive printing campaign uh, to sway elections and sway um, their politicians that supported prohibition into office. These are some of the pamphlets that they put out. Um, I, I just pulled these two, but they, as I said, printed something like 20,000 just in one weekend to deliver all over the United States, particularly to Washington, DC. Um, there were other groups, of course, besides the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, like the Scientific Temperance Foundation, uh, Federation, pardon me. And they were the ones who published this poster about uh, feeble puppies of alcoholic dogs, very early scientific backing for fetal alcohol syndrome and uh, uh, the abolishment of intoxicating liquors that way. Um, but there was, despite all of this pressure politics and people being elected to government that uh, we're gonna support temperance and prohibition, uh, four out of five congressmen drank during prohibition. Um, and even if they supported dry legislation, they didn't support it personally, they only supported it because that's what they thought their constituents wanted. Um, and this is one of my favorite stories supporting that. This is the man in the green hat. And the man in the green hat is George Cassidy. Um, he was a World War I veteran, um, but he struggled to gain employment after he came back from the war. And so he started bootlegging and selling illegal liquor. And a friend suggested to him that he could probably get better prices than anywhere in Washington, DC. 
And he started very slowly, just one state delegate and then another, and slowly he expanded his office um, until he was making 20 to 25 deliveries a day to Capitol Hill. Eventually he even had um, an office in Capitol Hill that was sort of a secret office where people could come and pick up their liquor um, instead of having it delivered directly to them. Um, of course, eventually he was caught. In uh, 1925, he was arrested with a briefcase full of liquor and uh, he was arrested again in 1929 and was convicted. Um, and that convinced him finally to give up bootlegging. Um, and this is just uh, some newspaper articles about his time. Man in the green hat. Um, some other things that influenced prohibition, just very quickly. Um, one of the most uh, powerful instigators of prohibition in America was World War I. Um, after the eruption of World War I, there was uh, extreme anti-German sentiment. And almost all of the prohibition groups, whether they were the Women's Christian Temperance Union or the Anti-Saloon League, used the war and the sentiment against German immigrants and German-owned breweries um, to advocate against beer. Their main reasons were that food will win the war, don't waste it, and don't waste our grain supply for, you know, uh, creating alcohol and beer. And also that the beer directly funded the Kaiser and was un-American and against the war effort. Uh, and of course, at the time, uh, that was a very powerful statement um, and definitely swayed quite a few people. Uh, getting to sort of a more local area, um, even though there are these broad national movements at play, they do come, come, of course, down, down to the local level. Here in Emmett County, by 1911, there were more than 30 counties in Michigan that were dry. Um, we faced uh, you know, the onslaught of the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And almost every election, there was a vote on whether or not the county, Emmett County, would be wet or dry. You can see here some newspaper articles um, about that, uh, the wets and the dries launching their various campaigns. They would hold parades and demonstrations trying to sway people to their side. Uh, we voted dry. This is a little uh, snapshot of the elections. Uh, but Emmett County was voted dry in 1909, 1911, and then in 1915. And a statewide amendment here in Michigan was actually passed in 1917. Uh, it went into effect on May 1st, 1918, uh, making uh, us dry two years before na uh, national prohibition. Uh, so you can see here, Michigan goes dry tomorrow, saloons and breweries close tonight. Um, the wets, of course, had their own arguments, and the wets did win. Actually, if we back up, you'll see um, dry and wet that in 1913, the wets briefly overtook the polls. Um, they argued that there should be moderation in alcohol consumption, but that prohibition itself simply didn't work. It encourages crime. It causes needless deaths because people are brewing liquor in their homes and, and it's not being regulated at all. And that there would be just a huge influx of homeless and unemployed people after all of these saloons and breweries closed. Um, one of the uh, quotes from these two ads, and these are directly from the Petoskey Evening News. So these are local Emmett County ads by the wets, say that prohibition means hypocrisy, blind tigers, lawbreakers, and crime. Um, of course, they're right, but we will get to that in a moment. So prohibition passes. And um, prohibition passed in Michigan. Uh, it went into effect May of 1918. And then in the United States, it went into effect uh, in January of 1920. Um, and the sale or importation of liquor was banned, uh, as was the brewing of liquor. Although there was one sort of loophole in that 
it wasn't against the law to consume alcohol, particularly in your own home. So many wealthier individuals stockpiled booze, especially in the two years leading up to national prohibition, um, running across the line of the Michigan and Ohio border into Toledo when Ohio was wet and Michigan was dry. Uh, there was a lot of stockpiling going on. And then of course, after uh, the entire country went dry, we could no longer get our booze from Toledo. And that is when the uh, Detroit became a center of bootlegging because we had to get all of our liquor from Canada. Um, so the 18th Amendment, which is prohibition, um, as I said, it prohibited the sale or manufacture of alcohol but the amendment itself didn't actually provide any guidelines for how to enforce the new amendment. So that's what the Volstead Act is. The Volstead Act actually provided um, the rules and regulations surrounding the sale of intoxicating liquors um, and how that was gonna work. Basically any liquid that contained more than 0.5% alcohol content by volume was prohibited. Um, so even the weakest of weak beer would not have made the cut. This gentleman here is Wayne Wheeler. He was recruited to the Anti-Saloon League um, and shortly after its founding, he was recruited and he was one of the main power players in the Anti-Saloon League. He actually helped write the Volstead Act um, and one, was one of the most powerful lobbyers for uh, abolition of alcohol. He was known as the dry boss. So the amendment has passed, the Volstead Act has passed, and now all that we had to do was enforce prohibition. And that proved to be um, sort of an unmitigated disaster. And uh, we'll get into that. Um, by the end of 1920, the US Customs Office reported that a million quarts of booze had been seized from run runners. So, these large sort of smuggling operations began almost immediately. Michigan had two years to perfect rum running before national prohibition. And we were well on our way by the time it was getting going and everywhere else. Um, this is where the rise of some of the heavyweight gangsters of our era begins. Capone, the Bernstein brothers of the Purple Gang, they all sort of got their start in the illegal alcohol trade. Um, and alcohol, rum running, bootlegging became the most lucrative industry in Michigan, except for the auto industry. That was the only thing that beat out the illegal liquor industry in Michigan. And prohibition agents and enforcement officers uh, were, were basically everywhere, not just in Michigan, completely understaffed, completely underpaid, and just could not stem the tide of this organized crime and corruption on such a large scale. Um, these crime syndicates used bribery, assassination, um, everything in their toolbox to avoid being arrested. Um, and of course, all of the wealth they accrued through their legal activities meant that even when they were arrested, uh, they could hire the best lawyers and generally weren't prosecuted for their crimes. Um, so typically law enforcement went after uh, sort of the little guys. So here in Harbor Springs, um, you can see that these sort of poor rural farmers are being arrested uh, as moonshiners. Um, Conrad and Neil Smith in Resort Township, George Hayes of Cross Village taken by Sheriff Purple. They found 30 gallons of mash and parts of a still in his house. Um, so not only is there sort of a national paradox where law enforcement is basically completely ignoring or not able to be effective in prosecuting these crime syndicates, but they're cracking down hard on small, small operations and individuals. Harbor Springs is exactly that same paradigm. Um, basically, as long as the large criminal operations didn't find their way here, the police were content to ignore large scale illegal activity but would crack down on small businesses and moonshiners. Um, so Harbor Springs, getting into the local, the local details of Harbor Springs during Prohibition. Uh, we were an interesting place. Um, 
obviously, as I was doing the research for this exhibit and for this presentation, there's no mention of booze or nightclubs or things like that during the prohibition period, which is from 1920 to 1933. Um, but it was everywhere. And later accounts, um, you know, from the 1980s, for example, have quotes like this. Uh, this is a gentleman named Al Gerhardt, who we are going to learn a lot about in a second. But he says that it was not hard to procure booze in Harbor Springs. A case of high quality gin cost 85 to $90 and bunk gin cost about 20 bucks a case. Mr. Gerhardt says, I think I sold to 99% of the resort people. I might have missed one or two, but I'll go for 99% if they had their $85. And mostly, for the most part, Harbor Springs catered to the resort community. Locals were encouraged not to get involved in rum running or bootlegging. And because even today, the resort and tourism industry is so important to our local economy, basically local police and officials knew that if the resorters were coming here and they wanted to have a fun night out and have some booze, that that was going to be good for the community overall economically. And they turned a blind eye to that sort of activity. And there were cabarets that flourished in Harbor Springs. The first one I'm going to talk about is Jewelerettes. So Jewelerettes actually was founded back in 1895. They started out as an ice cream parlor. Um, they had the first soda fountain in Northern Michigan. Um, according to Joe Jolaret, later on during the Prohibition period, not only was there alcohol, but there were 10 slot machines operating in Jolaret's. They had five nickel machines, three dime machines, and two quarter machines, and the proprietors split the profits 50-50 with the distributors. After Labor Day, all the machines were pulled out because, again, things like illegal gambling went hand in hand with illegal alcohol use, but as long as it was just the resorters the police didn't particularly care. So after Labor Day, all the illegal stuff was pulled out and it was business as normal again. Um, Jewelerettes added live music in the 1920s. They sold what they called setups, which was a bowl of ice and a soda for 50 cents. Uh, and then you brought your own booze and made your own cocktail uh, right there, you know, from your hip flask or, or something like that. Um, there was dancing and music every night at Jolaret's through the entire prohibition period. Um, there were cover charges of $1.50 for each person. They sold as many as 300 to 500 tickets a night at Jolaret's and the parties went until three in the morning. Um, it's interesting at the museum, we have some records um, of, of county and city business from this period, from the 1920s. And there are basically letters being written to city council saying that these dance halls needed to be shut down or they needed to close before 3 a.m. because they were becoming a public nuisance, which I think is just fantastic. Um, so this is one of the groups that sang at Jewelerettes. They were called the Toonsters. They are famous for writing their song, Sleepy Time Gal, while they were at Jewelerettes. Um, and uh, this is just a picture of them here on the stage at Jewelerettes um, and an article here talking about them. Now, um, as a side note for those of you local folks who know, because Jewelerettes was so incredibly popular, the resort families in Harbor Point, uh, the Harbor Point Association built the Little Harbor Club specifically to try to draw their children and back from Jewelerettes closer to home. So little side note. Um, but of course, Jewelerettes wasn't the only place that was flourishing during this period. One of the other places that was doing remarkably well was the Ramona Park Casino. Um, this catered to a more, uh, again, a resort population, a wealthier crowd. Um, and at that time, the word casino did not necessarily mean a gambling house. Um, it was a place for entertainment, for dancing, and for dining. Um, but of course, uh, illegal gambling was taking place there. Uh, the casino was first constructed in 1927 by Abe Ackerman, who was a Detroit-based nightclub owner. Um, he had some other partners with him, uh, Harry Kaufman and Burt Moss, for example. Um, but Ackerman himself was well known for running um, 
gambling and bootlegging operations down in Detroit. Um, and he moved to Northern Michigan after being arrested a handful of times in Detroit. Um, the Ramona Park Casino was built directly next to the Ramona Park Hotel, but they were run by two different owners um, and the owner of the hotel claimed to have no part in that casino business. Um, but the casino itself was uh, luxurious. It was lavish. It catered to sort of the high rollers of the era. There is a local report that the next morning on a local golf course, some of the caddies overheard the Studebaker brothers talking about losing $10,000 each just the night before, one night at the Ramona Park Casino. The uh, casino uh, that you see, let me back up, in this image uh, actually did burn down. It burned down in 1931, but was rebuilt in 1932. And you can see the picture here. It was rebuilt even bigger and better and more lavish than ever. Um, Jimmy Hayes, Mr. James Hayes, bought the casino and managed it during the summers during this time in the 1930s. Uh, he was Toledo based um, as a gangster and uh, ran nightclubs in that area. And in 1934, Jimmy Hayes was found beaten and shot in a Detroit alley. Uh, there was some speculation that it was Detroit's Purple Gang that had uh, assassinated him, but it's much more likely that Hayes, um, his competition in the Toledo area, specifically the uh, Likavoli family, were the ones who murdered him. Um, unfortunately for the Ramona Park Casino, after Hayes' death, his wife tried to manage it and tried to run it for several years, um, but eventually the club closed um, right after about 1939, and it never reopened because of World War II. It isn't until 1947 that the casino changes hands and is finally, um, looks like it's going to be reinvigorated, um, but unfortunately it is sold to Al Gerhardt, who again we're going to talk about in just a second, who owned a rival club and immediately tore down the casino. Uh, so unfortunately, that was the end of the Ramona Park Casino. But now, on to Al Gerhardt. Uh, so this is probably the most well-known and interesting um, gangster connection that Harbor Springs has, besides Jimmy Hayes. And that is Club Manitou. Now, Club Manitou opened in 1929, um, just outside of Harbor Springs, sort of across from the airport. and. It was run by Al Gerhardt, and we'll talk a bit about him in a second. Um, this is just a picture of the exterior of the building. It was made to look like sort of a rustic kind of log cabin feel, which was extremely popular at the time. And Club Manitou was uh, a restaurant. It was a fabulous dinner club. Uh, they had five course meals. They had lobster arriving every week via the railroads. Uh, they had chefs from New York. They had waiters who came directly from New York. Basically, it was an extremely classy, upscale, expensive place. But it had a secret. Underneath Club Manitou, in the basement, was a place called Slim's Speakeasy. And Slim is Al Gerhardt. So Gerhardt is quite a character. Um, and uh, he was fascinating to learn about during this process. He began life as Ella Schwender. Um, his family were uh, German immigrants. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1906. And very early on in his life, um, when he's only about 14 or 15 years old, in about 1920, he leaves home in Pennsylvania and goes to Detroit. Uh, he had two older brothers at the time who worked in Detroit and lived there. Um, and so he was, uh, we assume, living with them. We don't have a lot of evidence from this time period. But he is thrust into Detroit right as Prohibition begins and right as these bootlegging and crime syndicate organizations are rapidly growing. Now, Ella was mechanically gifted, you could say. His father was an engineer and he knew how to fix a car and drive a car, which at the time were skills that attracted the attention of bootleggers. And so he became a chauffeur for the Bernstein brothers, the leaders and founders of the Purple Gang of Detroit. Um, by the time he's 19, in 1925, he is arrested for the very first time. Uh, his first charge is um, uh, 
escaping child support. Uh, he didn't pay his child support. And so he's taken before a judge and admits at that time that he's a chauffeur for the Purple Gang. Um, that same year, he changes his name. He goes by Al Gerhardt. Um, we don't know exactly why he changed his name, but it could have been to continue to avoid those child support payments or perhaps to protect the rest of his family from his new Purple Gang acquaintances. Uh, because he was a tall, skinny, slim guy, they called him Detroit Slim. And later that was just changed to Slims. Now I said Club Manitou started in 1929. Gerhard is maybe 23 at this time, um, just the son of, of a German immigrant um, trying to get work in Detroit. Where does he come up with the money to build this lavish, extensive club just outside of Harbor Springs. Well, in this picture, you can see Slim on the right. And this person sitting next to him is Fatty Bernstein. Uh, Fatty is a brother-in-law of the Bernstein brothers of the Purple Gang. And he uh, is eventually arrested for, um, for murder, for extortion, and for all sorts of nasty business. Um, Basically, we believe that the club, Club Manitou, was founded uh, with backing from the Purple Gang because it was a convenient way for them to launder money. So, as I mentioned, Club Manitou, respectable, wonderful business, but if you knew someone who knew someone, you could get downstairs to Slim Speakeasy. The basement is actually quite a bit larger than the upstairs. So this on the left is a picture of the upstairs, the dining area when you first come in, the coat room. And then it's overlaid over the top of Slim's and this is the basement. And you can see on the right here, a full layout of the basement itself. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about these tunnels, these intriguing tunnels you can see coming off of Slim's in just a second. Um, but uh, let's talk about the rest of Slims. So Slims ran um, illegal alcohol and illegal gambling from 1929 all the way through prohibition and even after prohibition in 1933 ended, um, he was still doing illegal gambling. There was a craps table, two blackjack tables and three roulette tables in addition to slot machines. Um, the only way to get into Slims was down this stairway where you had to go actually outside and we'll come back to that image fairly frequently you had to come outside of the restaurant itself through the back way and down this outside staircase when you get to the bottom of the staircase there is a sliding concrete steel door on a rolling rack that is blocking your path so you got through that and you got into this entry room um, and just very quickly while we're at this portion, um, I have to express my deep thanks to Mr. Mark Huck um, and his mother who live in the Club Manitou building. And the basement of, of the building, Slim's Speakeasy, is still intact. And they allowed us to tour the building and to tour the space. And so that's where I get these lovely um, pictures of the now decrepit space. But you can imagine what it might have looked like back in 1929. So you come through the sliding steel door and you're in the entryway, which is right here. You can either go through these doors on the left and go into the entertainment space, or if you're an employee, you come through another giant sliding concrete door into the kitchen. Here's the entertainment space. Um, there are two sides of it, the entertainment room with the stage at the back, and then this gorgeous double-sided fireplace with arched entries on either side. You can see that in the picture here, the arched entries, brought you into the bar room where the bar was alongside one corner and there were a bunch of seats and uh, available uh, in the rest of the room. Now, back here on this mantle, this fireplace, you can see a slot machine right there just in plain view. This is some of the wait staff um, and people at Club Manitou in Slim Speakeasy. You can see that slot machine I mentioned right there behind them. Um, and this gentleman is Paul Pepper. 
Paul Pepper was the head waiter, the maitre d, and in order to get from that upstairs restaurant to Slim's, you had to get past Pepper first. He was sort of the gateway to the area. Now, that was if you went into the entertainment space right there. If instead you kept coming down, you would come into the kitchen. This is about a nine foot sliding concrete door, about three inches thick, again on a rolling track that was moved in front to block the entrance um, when they needed to. Um, past the kitchen is Slim's office um, and past that is a storeroom. And in this storeroom is another thick concrete door, three inches thick, that led into another storeroom, which through another concrete door led into a tunnel. And these two storerooms, I should mention, were behind a hidden bookcase. So this was a, is a secret within a secret down here in Slims. This is a picture of one of those concrete doors. This is actually from the bar room. There's a small door right here in the corner that led into one of the tunnels. Um, and you can see vaguely on the wall, there is a lever. And once you got into this space, you would pull the concrete door shut and raise that lever and it couldn't be pushed in or forced open from the bar side. Um, now these tunnels, uh, this one in particular went south towards the airport. Um, they are now collapsed um, and the actual exit point of the tunnels are unknown. Um, although the current owner's son thinks he might have found it. There's a little spoiler alert. Um, and he's also doing some, uh, having a geologist come with some uh, equipment to look through the ground penetrating radar, uh, to look through the ground uh, and see if he can find evidence of the tunnels. Um, now, as we're talking about these tunnels, I'm gonna show you some more of them, but it is important to remember that while Slim Speakeasy is built like a fortress, um, really the best way to keep your establishment from being raided um, by the police was to basically vet the people you had coming down. So Slim's best defense really was bribery. Um, there's evidence in FBI reports of the time that he was bribing um, the local sheriff. Uh, he was also bribing local townspeople to tip him off if the police were coming. And, um, you know, uh, basically avoid detection that way. These sort of tunnels and concrete storerooms would have been a last resort and potentially a place to maybe just shove some booze and hide some illegal equipment uh, rather than used as escape tunnels for people. In fact, several of these tunnels are not large enough for people to go through. So this tunnel here, which is uh, right off of Slim's office, it actually connects from the kitchen through the tunnel to the garage. Uh, this is an image of me <laughs> in the garage. This opening drops down about five feet straight down. And when you get to the bottom of that drop, there is the tunnel. And the tunnel is maybe only about a foot and a half wide, um, high, I should say. And even crawling, you would be hard pressed to fit through that tunnel. However, there is something that looks almost like a track on the floor. And at the very bottom, right before that tunnel starts, the owners found a champagne box from the era. And so we believe that potentially this was just a way to move booze from the garage where you unloaded your car through the tunnel directly into the kitchen without ever coming outside or being spotted. Now, some of the other tunnels, uh, particularly, let me go back to my drawing so you can see it particularly this tunnel here that ran to the airport. Um, you definitely could fit a person through those. Here's us standing on the side, um, coming through those concrete doors. Let me back up one second. So this is, we came through one storeroom's concrete door, through another storeroom's concrete door, and now this is that concrete door and we're in the tunnel itself. And there is this ingenious mechanism on a spring that as you move in, you press down on that lever and it pops up on the other end. And again, 
keeps that door from being forced open and from anybody being able to get into the tunnel after you. Uh, these are just some more pictures of SLIMS, uh, the Speakeasy. Uh, this is the band that played down there. Um, and this is some of what it looks like today. The floor you can actually see is still the original floor. Um, and that double-sided fireplace is still present in all of its glory. That's the stage right behind there. Um, now, SLIMS was doing so well that it actually was expanded. So in 1945, of course, this is well after Prohibition, which ended in 1933, uh, Slims added this entire building right here as an addition to the original structure. And this is where all the dining and dancing now took place. And there is a tunnel connecting the lower level of Slims to the new expansion. Um, but according to Gerhardt, guests didn't use that. It was just for staff to get there from the kitchen. Um, and you can see a really good view of the entire property there. Um, so just to wrap up talking about Gerhardt, I, I could go on and on about him, um, but he's really a person, he's got two faces. So uh, on one side, all of his neighbors absolutely gush about Al Gerhardt, um, that he was a kind man, a very generous person, um, true to his word, a very staunch friend, um, he donated to many worthy projects throughout the area. For example, if you're ever in a Lansing, there's a huge roadside park uh, as you come into a Lansing and there's a memorial um, and a, a statue there in the center of the park. Um, and if you go up to that, it will tell you that Gerhardt donated uh, to build that monument. Uh, and, and so that's sort of one side of Al Gerhardt. And then you have the gangster. Um, and these are all newspaper clippings about his gangster activity. Um, as I mentioned, he's first arrested when he's, you know, really young in 1925 for failing to provide child support. He is arrested only four years later in 1929, right when he starts Club Manitou. And this is a much more major incident. He is, um, uh, he's in a car with another bootlegger named Metis Hill. And as they are driving, they claim that another car passes them and shoots at them and hits their friend in the forehead and kills him. Um, it is much more likely that they pulled off to the side of the road and shot him in a bootlegging dispute. Um, but because there's no proof, Gerhard is never charged um, and the police don't have anything to go on. Um, one, of my, one of his next escapades uh, in 1934, this is right before his, um, uh, right after Prohibition ends and before he's thinking about expanding Club Manitou, uh, he and some of his um, employees go over to the Charlevoix Nursery near the Ironton Ferry over in Charlevoix. And they attempt to steal some shrubbery and some trees from the Charlevoix Nursery. This is called the Great Shrubbery Heist of 1934. Um, while they are trying to get away with their stolen trees, the caretaker of the nursery, James Wilson, comes out and finds them, discovers them, um, and they actually fire at him repeatedly. And Wilson manages to capture Gerhardt's two compatriots, but not Gerhardt. Um, they are charged in that action, um, although they, they don't see much prison time. Um, they're only sentenced to, let's see, Gerhardt gets nine months in the Jackson State Penitentiary for felonious assault um, during that shrubbery incident. Uh, and of course, we don't think he was there stealing shrubs. That's his story, that he was there um, stealing trees. But we think it's much more likely that there was a dispute with a fellow smuggler by the Iron Ferry uh, that led to that altercation. The final sort of gangster act I need to tell you about Gerhardt uh, is that he was part of a large counterfeiting operation. This is one year after the Great Shrubbery Heist, so this is 1935. Um, he meets with jazz singer Ethel Warner, and uh, if you've come to the museum recently, you'll notice two skeletons outside. We are part of the Skeletons Arise event in Harbor Springs, where all the local businesses put up decorated skeletons. Ours is Slim and Ethel um, together out front. And 
Ethel, Slim, and two other compatriots are cornered in Detroit in a hotel by the Secret Service. And while Gerhardt is trying to bar the door, his fellow smugglers are throwing $5,000 worth of counterfeit money out of the hotel window. And it's just raining down on the streets of Detroit. Uh, this is that newspaper article. I got such a kick out of reading this. Um, the very end of the press release states that Detective Jimmy Mahoney was on the ground trying to round up the money from pedestrians who were chasing that elusive dollar. Um, for their part in the counterfeiting scheme, both Gerhardt and his partner, uh, Fred Herrick, who was an employee of Club Manitou, got four months in the federal prison in Milan. Um, so, so far, Gerhardt has only served uh, let's see, nine months and four months for his uh, various transgressions. Um, in 1947, he's finally hit with gambling charges. Um, the State Liquor Control Commission does several different raids. They never actually make it into Club Manitou, um, but they still manage to build a case. And eventually, finally, in 1952, they revoke his liquor license and Gerhardt closes Club Manitou. Uh, he's down, but not out. He ends up going to West Virginia, where he operates another club called the Colonial Club, before that club is shut down for gambling-related offenses in 1963. Um, eventually, Gerhardt does move back to Northern Michigan. He and his wife retired. They lived near Crooked Lake, um, and Gerhardt passed away in 1987. All right, we're wrapping up. I have just two more slides for you to kind of finish out our lecture. So if you have any questions percolating, feel free to get ready to put them in the chat. Um, stepping back to the repeal of prohibition. So we've seen how it was, uh, how prohibition came about, how it was enforced, how it affected Harbor Springs. Um, why was it repealed? Well, um, basically because it didn't work. Uh, in 1929, uh, a woman named Pauline Sabin founded the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. Basically, prohibition had caused a huge influx in crime. And there were many other reasons that public opinion was turning against prohibition. Um, one of the reasons was the Great Depression. Um, the, uh, the country and the government realized that taxing alcohol was a big source of money and income. They also realized that banning alcohol wasn't keeping people from drinking it, wasn't keeping people from making it, and had actually led to basically an erosion in the public's belief in the law enforcement office in general. Um, because the enforcement was so ineffective um, and these crime syndicates became so powerful, it really was, uh, you didn't trust the police around you anymore. Um, and so one of the biggest parades to end prohibition, this is one of my, my favorite ones, um, this was the We Want Beer Parade. So you can see behind me, my We Want Beer people. Um, this was organized by New York City Mayor Jimmy Walker in 1932. There were 100,000 protesters that marched with him. Um, they are carrying banners in here. You can see beer for taxation. And then on this float here, beer for prosperity. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the onset of the Great Depression was uh, a big influencer as well. So uh, in 1933, the 21st Amendment is passed, which repeals prohibition. Um, so the 18th Amendment, which established prohibition, remains to this day the only amendment that has ever been repealed. And that is my lecture. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, there's much more detail about some wonderful local characters like Sheriff Purple here in Emmett County who policed the area during Prohibition and some of the other restaurants and cabarets downtown like Booth's um, in the exhibit here at the museum. Um, so like I said, I hope many of you will come to see the exhibit. Um, and uh, in case you weren't here at the beginning of the presentation when I mentioned this as well, we have lots of merchandise in our museum store related to Prohibition and related to our exhibit. Uh, and if you mention this lecture or tell us the secret code word, which is SLIM, 
type that in here in case any of you wonder. Uh, we'll give you 20% off uh, in the museum store. So please come and take advantage of that as well. So I will wait uh, just a moment um, to see if anybody has questions. Um, while we're waiting, I will let you know, I'm gonna pop back a slide because many of you are probably curious. This large building here, after it was shut down in 1952, um, Club Manitou remained empty for some years but eventually, in 1962, it opened again as Club Ponytail, uh, which was the renowned teen collegiate club in Harbor Springs. It was the exact opposite of Club Ponytail. Um, it catered only to teens and young adults. It was uh, completely non-alcoholic, uh, according to Club Ponytail uh, advertisements. Um, heavily chaperoned, soda fountain kind of place. Um, but Club Ponytail was uh, a huge success. It welcomed acts like Roy Orbison and Sam the Sham and the Beach Boys were the biggest group that played here. Um, and uh, Club Ponytail ran from 1962 until 1969 in this exact building um, until a large fire unfortunately spelled its end in 1969. Um, and you can learn more about that in the exhibit as well. Uh, so let me see, do we have any questions? I answered everything, huh? Uh, oh, is Club Manitou Duffy's? Not quite. So like I said, this is the Club Manitou building. Um, well, the original structure and then the expansion in 1945. And it burnt down in 1969 after it was Club Ponytail for a while. Duffy's is right across, right about here in this image where the current township hall is. Um, that was Duffy's. So not quite the same building, but very, very close to each other. That's a good question. Let's see. I'm actually not seeing any more questions. I'll stay on for a little bit in case anyone does have anything that they'd like to say. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us.